All right, this time around, we are doing a study on premarital and marital relationships. You can say, oh, pastor, you now listen to the voice of the Spirit. God has finally ministered to you. And I said this in the first service, that usually people think that it should be a very special subject. Not know, yes, it's a special subject, not knowing that the concept of premarital, marital, and postmarital, where the case is, or may be, is something that is already taught throughout the scriptures, throughout the different subjects of scripture. We'll talk about walking in love, being led by the spirit, prayer, you know, walking in the spirit. Where you apply them are in your relationships, which includes marriage. But then there are instances where we have to now talk about this particular subject for the purpose of helping believers walk in God's plan for their lives. Matthew's Gospel 28. Oh, you thought I was going to open the Songs of Solomon? <laughs> Matthew 28, Pastor, on this subject. <laughs> Verse 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All authority to us power given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. 20 says, Teaching them to observe. What things you have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So he says to teach them, which is the word didasco. It means to educate. And I said this in the first service, that Jesus did not send anyone out to start churches. The great commission is to go and start churches. But the moment he said teach, make disciples, church, or an assembly or community of believers became the necessity. And when they heard that, they knew that from the Old Testament books, the moment teaching is involved, then you must have an assembly. You must have people gathered together in a community of believers where there's oversight responsibility. So the church becomes a consequence of the Great Commission. You can't have church without the Great Commission. You can't have the Great Commission without church. So the didasco here is an educative word to instruct, to educate, which is the word in the Greek. In Luke's, uh, Matthew, uh, Mark, sorry, 16, and 15, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Shua Jelizo, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. And this sign shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out demons. Then he says, um, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents and the and they shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they the sick shall recover. Then in verse 19, it says, And after the Lord has spoken to them, was written in heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. They went forth everywhere, the Lord walking with them, they were stylicized, and confirming the word with signs following Amen. And we said earlier on that the gospel is not what the sinner hears. The gospel is what the church preaches. The gospel is what everyone who is a servant of God preaches. Whether you're talking to a sinner or a saint, your message must be the gospel. Hua Jeleon in the Greek. A message of God's kingdom. Okay, and the preacher of it are the messages called Basar in Hebrew, B-A-S-A-R, the message of a kingdom. So the kingdom of God, all right, the news of the kingdom of God, or the facts of the kingdom of God is what is referred to as gospel. So as we teach this morning, which is a subject that looks like a natural subject, we're still going to teach the gospel of it or the kingdom of God about it. That's what we're talking about, Basar. And so, this is the responsibility, again, of God's servants. Luke's Gospel 24 and 25, where it says, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And begin at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So, disciples are to be taught, all right? And when disciples are taught, that's Matthew 28, the message is the message of God's kingdom, Mark 16. And now we can see that it is the scriptures interpreted. Which scriptures is he referring to here? Begin at Moses and all the prophets, which means the reference here has to do with the Old Testament books. This is the Bible of Jesus, the Bible of the apostles, and it also must be our Bible, of course, now together with the epistles and the four gospels. So very critically, to know that we, we, we do have the responsibility of teaching every subject or concept from the New Testament through the Old Testament, from the Old Testament through the New Testament. In Luke's Gospel 24, again, verse 44, And he said to them, 
These are the words which I spake to you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Look at the consistency. Then verse 45, he opened ye their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Understanding the first word there is the word nohus, thinking pattern. The second word, uh, that they might understand the scriptures, is to read the scriptures together. To read it together. Son, which is what soon near me, S-U-N, means to read the scriptures together. So we mustn't segregate a portion of scripture. Even places where we are scared, where we are not comfortable with what is said there, we have a duty to read it, understand it, in our worship of God. So that's important uh, in our study of scripture. John 20. Now, I mentioned this earlier that John is not a synoptic like the other three. Uh, it has a lesser percentage of synopsis because John's 90% of John's content is not in Matthew, Mark. And look, it's unique to John. So usually not referred to as synoptic. E.W. Kenyon will say it's the closest to the epistles, correctly said, in John 20, 21. Then said Jesus to them, Again, peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins you retain, are retained. Which means that here, by receiving the Spirit, we share in God's responsibility in the earth. God is the one who forgives sins. It's not man doesn't forgive sins or remit sins, but by giving us his Spirit, we become partners with God. Micah 7. Quickly look at it. Micah 7 tells us God's role as touching sin. Micah 7. And of course uh, Psalm 103, blessed uh, 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 um, uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not his benefits. Uh, Psalm 103, uh, who forgives you all your sins. So in Micah 7 verse 18, who is like who is a God like unto you that pardons iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? And he says, he remains, there's not his anger forever because he delights in mercy. So you see, this is God's role. But when he gave us his spirit, we can share in that responsibility by being God's agents in the earth as we dispense his remission of sins and his forgiveness. And where men you know, re refuse or rebel against what we're saying, their sins are retained. But the key issue here today is the fact that we are supposed to be learners of the word. Matthew 28. We're supposed to be disciples. Matthew 2, all right, pay attention here, verse critical, in Matthew 28, 19, means to relearn, okay, let's start again, means to learn, to relearn and unlearn. To learn, relearn, and unlearn. And we see instances like that. In Matthew 13, 52, we found out the scribes. Scribes in their time were learned people already. They were scholars. But scholars were now learning. Now, if a scholar is learning, that means he's relearning, he's unlearning, as he is learning. And that's important. That when it comes to discipleship, you choose to learn, to relearn what you had learned before and to also unlearn things that you had known. Matthew 13, 52, scholars. Then Matthew 27, verse 57. We had a rich man, wealthy, experienced, well-known fellow, business magnate maybe, but a ruler of the Jews. His name was Joseph of Arimathea, a big man. Or else who can go to Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus? Can I have his body? And he's giving freely. <laughs> That's a big boy. But the Bible says he's also relearning. Matthew 27, 57. He's also unlearning. He's also starting again. So the word of God is such that you and I must give our submission to it. To learn, relearn, and also unlearn. So earlier today, in this first service, we said one of the ways to learn is to ask questions. I said the kind of questions you ask will show how wise you will become. Questions show that you seek for wisdom. Questions is part of discipleship and growing up. If you don't ask questions, that means you have nothing to learn. 
So we ask questions. And I said earlier, I must emphasize this, that age has nothing to do with wisdom. Age should be wisdom, but it hasn't happened like that in many instances. We have seen complete, complete idiots who are old enough to be idiots. We have seen, oh, you heard that, right? We have seen people who should know that don't know. So Elihu, in Job 32, had to lament Job 32. He said in verse 6, I'm young and you are very old. Wherefore I was afraid, does not show you my opinion. But I said in verse 7, they should speak, multitude of years should teach wisdom. Then he says, there's a spirit in man. It's the inspiration of the Almighty that gives them understanding. Then he says in 9, great men are all, not always wise. Neither do the aged understand judgment. That's absolutely correct. So which means that because a man has been married for a long time, does not mean he has wisdom. The fact that somebody has been in the ministry for a long time also, it should be naturally. But wisdom is from the word of God when it is practiced. Wisdom is the word of God when it is practiced. Say with me, wisdom, wisdom is the word of God when it is practiced. So we said, questions show the wisdom that you seek or whether you get wisdom at all. So we looked at Luke, two, Luke chapter 2 and we looked at Jesus. I'm just going to go over that quickly. I mentioned that in the first service already. Luke's gospel 2 and 40 tells us Jesus grew and waxed strong in spirit and is filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. So we said, how did he, he grew in wisdom? Jesus did not automatically become a teacher of the word. No, he grew. He didn't come to the world full of the word. No, he came as a man. He was a reset by God where he started as a man, normal man, normal human being, even though pre-exists as God. In fact, in verse 52, he says he increased in wisdom and stature, which means Jesus also grew spiritually. Jesus at age 8 was not as wise as age 12. Jesus at age 12 was not as wise as age 30. He grew up. He matured. How did he mature? We found out. In priority. When they came to Jerusalem for the Passover in verse 41, he stayed behind among the doctors of the law. And I said to us in the earlier service, your company will show how wise you will become. And that's not just in spiritual matters. It's in any kind of matter. The kind of people you surround yourself with will be how you are going to end up. Proverbs 13, 20 says the wise walks with the wise, but it's a companion of fools that perish together. And I used an illustration earlier that there was Jonathan. Jonathan knew that David was the king. He was aware. He knew God had anointed David, but he stuck with Saul. Jonathan is a nice guy, a good guy. He's not a bad guy. He has no bad record, has nothing. In fact, he has a cleaner record than David. But see, God chose David. Jonathan knew God chose David, but he will come to David. He will come and meet David in his prayer room, pray with David, fast together. They will minister to the Lord together, have Holy Ghost meetings. Then he will go back to Saul. So when Saul's house came down, because of association, Jonathan came down with it. The companion of fools perished together. You might not think you're a fool, but the moment you associate with a fool, closely and intimately, that's why, this is interesting, this is ahead of time, I shouldn't say this today, but I want to say it today. That's why you see a smart woman marrying a, an alpha smart man. Oh, you got that, thank you for that. And you say, ah, ha, ah. I, I don't want to mention any name, so you think it's you. Or just mention it, say, ah, ah. But you were better than this. Mm -hmm. The other way around. A smart man <laughs> marries a. And you, okay, you didn't. Uh, uh, and, and you say, ah, what happened to you? It's association. So, where was Jesus found? He was found in verse 46 in the midst of doctors of the law. Always surround yourself with people that, that are going to where you are going to. Whether it's 
business, whether it's your career, whether it's ministry, you must have the right kind of people around you. There are people that, you know, when I speak within my own field and world, not talking ministry now, they inspire me to do what I do. Remember one time that that I said, this is one of my mentors, uh, and he said, he laughed at me. And that laughter was not funny. What do I mean by that? From that laughter, I gained wisdom. I didn't feel he was making fun of me. I felt what he said was a learning curve for me. And I took the lesson. Years later, when we saw, he said, man, you've really grown. I said, yeah, from your laughter, I had to grow. I didn't say that to him, but I said that in my heart. You know, but that's just it. You have to be happy with the right kind of people. You know? And that's why sometimes, thank God for your classmates, but sometimes your classmates just don't necessarily mean you are going to the same place. So I say, ah, you know, we have been friends. You know, my childhood friend. Like, you know, a woman asked a husband one time, the husband said, that guy is my friend. He's my, I say, how is he your friend? I said, we have been childhood friends. I say, when last did you see? Uh, about 15 years ago. <laughs> you don't know him now. You don't know me because you've known them 10 years ago. So, which means, anyway, the, bo- the point is, get yourself around people that are going to where you're going. Jesus had this kind of people. So he was able to ask the right question. You don't ask a Bible question in the carpentry workshop. Hope you understand that. You know? In some of us, sometimes in our office, you now be asking Muslims about things in the Bible. Have you not read it? And like in school. Aren't you stupid? So here we are. He asks a question. Eperotau. I use the word Greek, the Greek word eperotau, E P E R um E P E R O T A O. It means to inquire, to seek for an answer, to seek for a solution. So Jesus did that. He asked the questions. He asked them questions. Why did he ask them questions? Because they had the scriptures. We said that word is used 56 times. So by, by the questions, it therefore shows that he gained wisdom. He gained wisdom. So we said earlier that it's the right kind of questions. There are questions you ask that will never get you wisdom because of why you ask them. There are questions you are asking the wrong person. I'm sure Jesus did not ask the doctors of the law how to because he's a carpenter, so there are two things that he should be doing. Uh, one of them is to uh, obviously work with building houses, because carpenter in that time is majorly to build. So he's a builder. I'm sure it's not asking them how to build. And I'm sure it's not asking them uh, other questions about how to invest. That would be the right question, or maybe the wrong question, with the wrong people. You must ask the right person. The right. You don't go to your pastor and ask him whether you should do cryptocurrency. Where is he going to explain that from? Even Moses knew nothing about it. With due respect to my Lord and Savior Jesus, he knew nothing about it. Paul had no idea. So he said, Pastor, just know, what do you think? That's a wrong question. But ask the right person the right questions. You can ask Elon Musk. I think he made money from it. Ask him that. I heard so. I'm not sure how this is not authoritative. I beg you. You ask the right person the right question. So you must ask the right questions. You must ask the right person the right questions. You must also ask the question for the right reasons. So in the first service, we looked at that use of questions in Matthew. And we found out, pay attention, that you had Pharisees also ask Jesus questions. Let's look at the Max rendering. In Mark 10, verse 2, they asked him a question. Look at it. Let's, we have to move very quickly now. Mark 10, 2, they asked him a question to tempt him. You can never gain wisdom when you're asking a question to test someone. Except you are the person's teacher. Because you only test someone that you know more than the person. You are the person's teacher. So they assumed they were his teachers. They assumed they knew what he didn't know. So they were testing him. You don't ask a question from your pastor to test your pastor. That is stupid. You ask the question to learn. They weren't doing that. They were asking a question to test him. In verse 17, 
a rich young ruler also came and asked him a question from the responses he got. We're not sure of his motives. In Mark 12, verse 18, we find the Pharisees again, they asked questions. They asked questions basically again to tempt him. Mark 12, 18. Mark 12, 28. They asked him a question. Pay attention. Having heard reasoning together, perceived that he had answered them well, asked him, what is the first commandment? Again, they are not honest. These are not honest questions. But you know the interesting part? Jesus' answers is now a benefit to us, but not to them. In spite of the fact that they ask the questions. Because when you ask the wrong question with the wrong motive, you will never get wisdom from the person. But we, having the right heart, we are now gaining wisdom from what Jesus said, but they never did. Because if they did get wisdom, they would not have conspired to kill him. So when you ask the wrong questions with the wrong motive, even though the person has the answers, the answers won't get to you. So your heart matters a lot in how you ask questions. Mark 12, 28. Now Mark 14, 60. The different one now. They asked him, question, the high priest was asking him, with the bead to what? With the bead to crucify him. Same in verse 61. They wanted to get him into trouble. So there are right questions and there are wrong questions. In Mark 15 too, Pilate asked him, curiously, are you the king of the Jews? He's not asking a question to learn. He's asking a question out of insecurity. Verse 4. He said he has answered nothing. Then verse 44. Mark, Mark 15, 44. Same thing. So you have questions that will never bring wisdom because that was not the intention. I skip Mark 5. Let's check Mark 5. Mark 5 and verse 9 where Jesus asked the demon, what is your name? You know, that's the cast out of the demon. Mark 7 verse 5. The Pharisees asked him why his disciples were not walking in the tradition of the elders. Again, the question is not to learn. The question is to prove a point. And you will never learn that way. Yet, pay attention here, his disciples also asked him questions. Look at the difference. Mark 7 and 17. Mark 7, 17. They asked him about the parable. He explained. Please explain to us, sir. Mark 8, 23. They asked him if he saw. That's the, the blind man. The disciples asked them. Then 27. Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? He asked his disciples in 27. A question that will lead to a proper response, and then a learning. So there are questions that lead to learning. Ensure that those are the questions that you are asking. 29, whom do you say that I am? Who do men say I am? Sorry, 27, who do you say I am? The right kind of questions. Mark 9 and 11. They asked him, why do the scribes say Elijah will come? These are questions from his own disciples. It's not curiosity now. It's to learn. Mark 9.16. He asks the scribes, what question are you with them now? He's the one doing the question. Mark 9.16. Mark 9.21. How long ago since he came? They said of a child asking about how to heal the sick, I mean, uh, the case of the sick. Mark 9.16, Mark 9.21. Men, okay, I mentioned that. Mark 9.28. Why couldn't we cast him out? They asked that question. You cast the demon out. Why couldn't we cast him out? And he gave them an answer that is useful for us today. He asked the right question. And afterwards, were they able to cast out demons? Because they asked the right 
questions. Were the Pharisees ever casting out demons? No, because they questioned why he was casting out demons. Always ask the right questions. Your foolishness and wisdom are revealed in the questions that you ask. Then verse 32. When he answered them, they understood not what he was saying and were afraid to even ask him. Verse 33. And then he came to the Capernaum. Then he said, you know, ask him, why are you guys thinking about yourself? Then he answered. So when God asks a question, like Jesus does here, it's to elicit a response that can make him teach. Sort of man can these dry bones leave? Oh, you know. <laughs> then he answered. So God does ask rhetorics to, for us to learn from. Mark 10, verse 10. Disciples asked him again of this matter. A disciple must ask questions. What did I say? You must ask questions. Mark 11. Uh, Mark 12, sorry. Mark 12, 34. Mark 12, 34. Disciples ask him a question again. Mark 12, 34. And then Mark 13 and verse 3. They asked him questions privately. Do you notice that much of the questions they asked him were private? Which means they're not trying to, it's not a show. Private questions. Maybe in the cell meeting, in the fellowship meeting, they ask the questions. So there are questions you will ask that will bring knowledge. And there are questions you will ask that are mischievous. Ensure you are asking the right questions. Now I mentioned something earlier. And I'll say it again. And I said, there are questions you will ask your pastor. That's not his responsibility. Even though it's along the line of the subject that he's teaching. It's still not his responsibility. On the subject of marriage, we should know the limits and limitations of a pastor. And I'm going to mention a few of that. So earlier on, we said, are there questions which you ask about marriage? I said, yes. And the moment you mention marriage, you are going to have to talk about sex. I mean, let's talk about sex. It has to be, that's exactly what you are discussing. Because when Jesus was asked a question about marriage, Matthew 19, and it's about divorce, about putting away the wife. Matthew 19, interestingly, Matthew 1 opens with a divorce case. Joseph and Mary. And I must repeat that what I said earlier in the morning. That here is Matthew 1, 19. Imagine um, Joseph's girlfriend, no, not necessarily girlfriend, but um, betrothed to, that their, their culture is different from our culture, where they betrothed to a man and his spouse to him, and he has marital rights, but they have not yet become conjugal rights. So she comes one morning and say, Blessed be God. I am pregnant for God. The guy says, You know, and I said this, it looks very funny. But assuming he picked his phone and called his friend. Or quickly he went on Twitter or Instagram which is the latest God of this world. He go on Facebook. You know, imagine if you had done all of that or quickly called his mom, Mommy! Come on, here, what, what's her name again? Mary or Mary or Ma Maria? What? The mother said, I told you. <laughs> she said, I told you what the prophet said. I says, what did you just say? She said, nowadays. Then he told his friends. Quickly text his friend. Something's going on. It's very, very urgent. Come now, 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 now. The guy goes, hmm, what's going on? I tell him. You know, as soon as he had done all that, the angel will just turn back. Ah, who would the angel have conversation with now? Because the angel will have to go to each house. It's not like that. <laughs> because of someone who is a child. And some of us are just like that. We are not discreet at all. You just say, it's just between you and I. You say it to four people. 
<laughs> just this was us. And I just, I don't want to, I just, just, I mean, I, you know, because we're, the way we have been, I have to tell you. And to five people. Are you an octopus? In your mind. Don't do that. So he was discreet enough, which means God, and I said in the first service, God knew who he chose. There are some of us, you can't qualify. You can't. You can't even be a Mary. Imagine Mary too. As soon as she, the angel finished with her and she got prayer and just called, friendship me. <laughs> ah, this is between you and what God is doing in my life. <laughs> I'm pregnant for God. Though. It's a girl talk. <laughs> and you know, you say, oh, I thank God for your life. And the friend will say, oh, here's the Lord. Hallelujah. And he gets home and says, ah, what happened to Mary? You thought she was, ah, ah. Now, wow. It's God that knows who is serving him. <laughs> and then you see the person just goes on Facebook and starts the right article. Beware of hypocritical friends. You make things difficult. I'm sure by the time she met Elizabeth, the prophecy would have been different. John the Baptist would not kick. <laughs> you just go, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Which means, don't get into a relationship with loudspeakers. Some people, they bring demons into their lives. And you know, you know they're very smart. See the kind of things that God used them for. As soon as the wise men came and God told them, leave. Imagine if Joseph is the kind of person that tells everybody, he will just tell his name, um, call his body, my body. I, I go to Egypt. But tell no man. Just me, you, God, the child and the mama. And I said, oh, okay. So the body, you go and meet another guy. My body told me to tell nobody. <laughs> Mary will have just told her friend. Eh, 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 eh. Clara, Clara. I didn't say Lara, I said Clara. I said, Clara, ah, my husband told me yesterday that God told me that we should go to Egypt. I don't know, but I'm just wondering why. Can't God save us here? Uh, you save you and the, uh, you save you and why should you go? Don't go. Uh, I don't know what his plans are. Which God will tell you to go to Egypt? Which Egypt? Egypt. Egypt that our forefathers will come and don't listen to him. As they're arguing and arguing and arguing and arguing, that's how Clara will go and put it on a blog. Please advise a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> The crucifixion would have happened earlier. <laughs> so you can see that we had discreet people God was using. And you had Joseph. You had Mary. She kept the sayings in her heart. Do you know when she eventually revealed the sayings? Upon the resurrection. There are things you don't say. I'm sure the incarnation, incarnation story came afterwards. How would you start explaining that? And I say, ah, and they say, they say, ah, this Jesus, we don't believe in you. Believe him, oh. Hmm. Are you aware that he came by the Holy Spirit? Ah. No, no, relax. You are trying to help him, oh, but you are worsening the case. Are you aware? Hmm. See, I had not even had sex with the father. That's how he came. <coughs> in government college, then, when, when he hears his, his father, he says, <coughs> <laughs> It's a sign that Ogbo, ogbo. <laughs> see, ah, seriously, ah, you see, Allah Akbar. Ah, ah, ah. See, it's not necessary. When he rose from the dead, I will not tell your story. It will not make sense. There are some things that you don't have to say it now. Some people say, no, the way something comes to my I must say it. Are you a mad person? <laughs> it's only a mad person that says, I'll say it. Say it. <laughs> ah, go and get a shrink. Just have sex. No, it's, 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 it's. even if it's a prophecy, you still calm down. Relax. So you can see God dealt with discreet people who knew how to keep information. 
when the incarnation happened, if they were texting everybody and go to the king, the king has been born. It will take two years. I only don't know until two years for some of our brethren. It's the second day. In fact, you'll be doing selfie among in the manger. <laughs> Say, prophecy fulfilled. <laughs> you are saying the devil is after you. No, you went after the devil yourself now. <laughs> Say, I'm discreet. I'm discreet. I am a wise person. Wise. wise people are known by fewer words. Fewer words. Look at something. Look at this Bible. It spans thousands of years. It has God's word. That shows you God is not talkative. Some of us, your commentary last week alone is more than this book. The things you said last week, you can't even know who you spoke to. Eh? Did I tell you? <laughs> you told me, ah, I didn't know. Okay, you told me too. I told you. Yeah. That's how God wants it. Oh. So in Joseph and Mary, we find a way a couple should be a discreet. Hallelujah. Anyway, so we said the Bible opens up with that. So when they ask Jesus the question in Matthew 19, Amen? In Matthew 19, he answered with verse 5. A man will leave father and mother, cleave to his wife, Joan, in the Greek, and they shall be one flesh. And I said in the first service, one flesh refers to sex. Genesis 2.24. It's a sexual union. So marriage is also a sexual union. Therefore, if you are thinking about marriage in a premarital manner, or in a marital manner, or you want to take a post-marital decision, you must talk, think about sex. And we said, God made man a sexual being. It's not a strange feeling. It's not a demonic feeling. In fact, some denominations got to a point, very ridiculous theology, and said that the sin that even Adam committed was sex. That's awful and ridiculous. Now, there are other things around it. And that's because we don't have the right commentaries around sex. Just fasten your seatbelt. Right? I need you to fasten your seatbelt so that we will not, I will not shake you off your seat. Now, another thing, I said this in the first service, I was to the close, so I'll just go over it again. Marriage has to do with sex. It is not all about sex, right? But it has to do with sex. Right? Now, I don't think I need to do an illustration on what sex is, right? You shouldn't be in this service if you don't know that. Or you should do a diet menu. I wouldn't. So, which means, is it right to ask a question about sex? Now, notice... The question they asked Jesus about sex had to do with marriage. Okay? Pay attention. He wasn't answering sexual styles. Right? Right? Stop looking at me like I'm the devil. That's not what he asked. He wasn't asking questions on when to have sex in a couple. No. He just said, a man should live with father and mother and they come together and they will have sex. Now, pay attention. So we said in the first service, and I said, where is the Bible commenting about? The Bible comments about marriage and the sexual experience of it. Why? Then I, asked, I said that if you ask questions on this, I'm just repeating what I said earlier, ask you to learn from the word, one, to get wisdom, then two, to practice your faith. So I asked another question. I said, is marriage peculiar to believers? Of course not. Marriage is between two consenting adults who remain faithful and loyal to each other. And so it's in every, it's in many cultures. And I said this earlier, 
that because people are not born again doesn't mean God does not endorse their marriage. Doesn't mean God uh, doesn't mean God made them marry. Doesn't mean God led them to marry. Simply means whatever they have done is of God. They don't have to be Christians. When Adam, when God called Abraham, he already was married, and God walked with who he had married, Sarah. Interestingly, Sarah was his sister, half sister. They had the same father, but not the same mother. So, which means that I mentioned earlier, marriage, right, has a dint of culture, but it must not be subsumed under culture. That goes into the concept of wedding. And I said the concept of wedding is the decisions of the consenting adults. They can decide to use their culture. And please do not use Bible culture. You will look not just archaic, but very unintelligent. The culture of marriages, or sorry, wedding ceremonies in the Bible didn't come from God. It came from their native culture. In the Old Testament is ancient next and culture. In the epistles, a mix of that and the Greco-Roman culture. So don't adopt it. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Do not adopt it. The honeymoon culture in the days of Moses is something that if you do it now, you will grow poor for the rest of your life. It's one year. No work. You can only afford that in the wilderness. Also, when it comes to age, you'd be shocked to know that Mary, the mother of our Lord, was barely 13 or 14. You try that today. Say, Mommy, I think the Lord wants to use me. What did he say? In fact, in some time today, it's going to be called uh, child marriage. And so, age? Nope. The Bible has a commentary on maturity, which we're going to look at, but it has no age span. Critical things. But your faith is important as you have instructions of not going to the Philistines to marry or to Egypt or to Babylon. That is theological. So which means your theology is important. Second Corinthians 6, 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That goes into your marriage. First Corinthians 7, 39, Paul says marry in the Lord. So which means that even though it's your choice, your faith dictates who you marry. Also, marriage has to do with responsibility. Shall a man leave father and mother? That statement is a, a wholesome statement. It shows responsibility, emotional, mental, and physical responsibility. And it's not just for the man, even though it says father, leave father and mother and cling to his wife, but that's only communicable because of the patriarchal culture of their day. But both male and female should be emotionally, physically, and maybe financially independent. So I often say, girls don't, uh, uh, girls don't marry boys, boys don't marry girls. And a boy can be 40. Every comment, mommy said. So at that point, your marriage is going to be a tripartite agreement, likely a trinity or a godhead. Maturity, responsibility. So we said also, your wife is not your helpmate. Genesis 2.18, I've done that study for us over the years. It may look controversial, but a human being cannot be your helpmate. Helpmate is Azar. Azar is somebody who saves you from trouble. Well, that's likely if you go marry a boy. You may have to be his helpmate. Because he's going to get into trouble a lot. Is going to put his hands in things he shouldn't like fire. But in case you want to have a good marriage, ensure you are not, you are neither help meat. Right? And that could also be, include fish as well. Depends on how you see the word meat. <laughs> Thank you for understanding that. So you have, and again, please, in God's holy name, don't say, when you talk about marriage, let's go to the beginning. The beginning wasn't so nice. Let's see Adam and Eve. I don't like that kind of marriage. The very first time they give testimony, the husband is saying, is the woman you gave me. And because she didn't have kids yet, she said it was a serpent. 
I'm sure if our kids were around, she'd have said it's Kay. So please cast away that kind of marriage. Now we said also, a sex for procreation. I was going to deal with that earlier. Now I met these people who were in the church where they said you only have sex to have children. Uh, how do you determine when the kids will come? And they said, well, that they told her that as soon as he, she's pregnant, we stop. That the next time we must have sex is when the Lord has told come off it. So, ah. And I said, it's not true. The sexual relationship in marriage is for pleasure. Amen. You went quiet, right? Okay, let's do some study in case you want to see it. In Genesis 4.1. And this is how I explained to that couple, and they felt very free. Bad theology can be horrible. Can be extremely horrible. In the first service, I showed you in first service that divorce is something we should talk about. It's not something we should promote, but it happens. Right? And I showed you, Jesus said it can happen if there's hardness of heart. Then Paul says, if you marry a non-believer, or if you're already married to a non-believer, then you should go and marry a non-believer. And he decides to go. Paul says, number one, don't separate, whether male or female. But he says, if he or she decides to go, you are not in bondage. And I've met people who were told by their church, if the man is still alive, you can't marry any other person. What kind of ridiculous theology is that? If he's alive, do you what? <laughs> and this man that this woman is waiting upon the Lord for has been married with three children. He has moved on. She said, is that I'm still married to him? Even spirit husband, it doesn't take that long. I said, you are not married to him. I said, I said is that true? He's, can't you see his wife? You're not married to him. He's not married to you. Marriage is choice. If he's not with you, he's not with you. God cannot say, be with him. Be with her. Paul says, you're not under bondage. But sometimes it's so late in the day, by the time they get to know. Because these things are pushed down people's throats. Very horrible. Are you following what I'm saying? I love a prominent general overseer in Nigeria. I respect him a lot. His wife passed on less than a year. The man of God just walked in the spirit. And he married. And I said, he's really a holy man of God. He's just been objective. Do you get my point? So there's some things like that people just push down their throats. Genesis 4.1 Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. Now, if it was just for procreation, then the word knew would never have been used. The word here is yada. It means to intimately experience someone. Genesis 3.5 You will know in good and evil, Adam and Eve. Genesis 3.7 they knew they were naked. Genesis 3.22. To know good and evil. That's to know intimately. So it's forced intimacy. It's not forced a baby production machine. That is why it is not out of place to have contraceptive. People have quoted Onan and that's just ridiculous. It is totally not and you have denominations that are against contraceptives, but that's ridiculous. Because you say, well, you know, God gives seed, etc., etc. That if you if you if you waste seed, then that means that you have sin. And I ask the question. That means every time you have sex and there's no child, you have wasted seed. He said, no. Also, because you wasted that one inside someone, is it not the same thing? They say, oh, you are getting too technical. No, it's not technical. Is engineering. Stop saying rubbish. So people have been, they've been bound by such wrong teaching. Sex in the marital institution is falsely for pleasure or else you should have sex maybe once in a lifetime or twice. Let's look at a very classical case. You had God speak to Sarah. She was going to have a child. I like Sarah's response, but I'm very honest. Genesis 18, verse 11. It ceased to be with her for the manner of women. That's a big word. It means that our hormones were responding. The manner of women is not just having children. That means it, that brings in a lot of 
concept there are hormones, are, are sexual disposition. That's a man of women. I told you it's natural to feel that way. Look what she says in 12. She laughed with me and says, <laughs> and waxed old. Shall I worship the Lord? Is that what she said? Shall I have pleasure? Because there must be pleasure before children. Amen? Amen. Up of Jesus. Let me tell you the meaning of that word pleasure so you can get it right. Is the word Eden. I mean Garden of Eden. <laughs> Let's see the other words there. <laughs> it's used for delicacy. Second Samuel 124. It means it has to be something sweet. Left to some women, the experience of childbirth is not delicacy, but the predecessor is. Oh, sign you come on. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Second Samuel 124. You daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with delight. That's the word he then delight. Psalm 36 and verse 8. Psalm 36 and verse 8. It shows that premarital couples should discuss this. They should. I've seen people get married and then they discuss it afterwards. You don't discuss, sorry to use this example, job conditions when you started working. Say, so, okay, how far? Someone say, well, all I just feel towards her is ministry. I don't feel anything sexual. Or okay, go look for somebody else. <laughs> you get it. How can you be feeling ministry? There are many believers in church. In fact, for men, for ministry, I just see the Lord using us. <laughs> Don't be an idiot. Psalm 36, verse 8. Shall be abundantly satisfied with the rivers of pleasure. Satisfaction. Jeremiah 51, 34, Amos 1, 5. So, which means it's pleasure, then children. You don't separate it. And we find husbands today, we're not there yet because I'm not focusing on husband yet. When we get to what are you doing, self? And you say, oh, you know, since we're no longer having kids. No, it's not about kids. Kids will come, yeah, but it's about pleasure. So God made man a sexual being. Now, is there procreation? We're going to explore that. The essence of procreation is now not for your pleasure. Sex is for your pleasure, but the essence of procreation, listen carefully, is to be God's agent in the earth about his new creation plan. See how it goes. Sex is pleasure. But raising kids and procreation is not pleasure. No this and no peace. Procreation is not pleasure. I just like seeing children. Excuse me? No. You have a responsibility to raise a child for God. God has shared his creative abilities with us in procreation such that we must think like him when we are having children. Now get it right? Don't think like him when you are having sex. That is not holy. It's pleasure. But when you have kids, you think like God. Who is this? And what is he for? Again, like I mentioned, it's wrong theology to say sex is to have kids. No. It's ridiculous. First Corinthians 7. In Genesis 2.24, kids were not mentioned. In Matthew 19, again, verse 5, when Jesus spoke about one flesh, kids were not mentioned. In 1 Corinthians 6, kids were not mentioned. So, look at 1 Corinthians 7. All right, I didn't even go through this quickly. You know, earlier on in the first service, we said that there were questions that were asked Paul about marriage and sex, relationships, singles, 1 Corinthians 7. Interestingly, Paul is not married. Which means that being married or otherwise is not why you should not know what I'm teaching. The fact, at the moment you are in the ministry or you are involved in discipleship, you must know this. I began marriage counseling, this is 26 years. 
And I was not married. And I'll sit down people and I'll teach them from the word of God. And, can't, and I've seen all sorts. There was a day like that. My head escaped a missile. In settling an issue. So from that day henceforth, I settled it from afar. Oh yeah. There are things I've learned to do. I used to learn, I used to also go and break news to people. The not too good news. But there was a day like that, that a woman ministered to me. And you think I fought with a lion. So from that point, there's a way I say it. You sit afar, I'll sit close to you, and I'll say in a way that the Lord will help both of us. I'm just trying to say that these are things you learn, you know, without necessarily being in the institution. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, <clears throat> verse 1, he says, It's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her husband. This establishes the essence of sex. Then in 3, let the husband render to the wife due benevolence, likewise also the wife to the husband. He's discussing sex here. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. Likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body. This is a very serious counterculture narrative. In the ancient nation culture, the man has power over his wife's body, but not otherwise. Paul is saying, no, that's ridiculous, because that's a hard heart. It's a conjugal, mutually accepted obligation. And Paul in verse 5, and that's true. Because when you look at some cultures in Africa, you just say, uh, go and call your mother. And, just, and you just say, they're just basically sexual objects. That is totally unbiblical. It is a conjugal duty and responsibility. In verse 5, defraud not one another. Wow, Paul, defraud? Oh, yes. He uses the word aposterio. A-P-O-S-T-E-R-E-O. -E -E it means to cheat. That means that when a man doesn't give the wife sexual privileges or sexual pleasure or sexual experience, he's cheating. That's actually what the Bible calls cheating in marriage. Mark 10, 19. The word aposterior is used. To defraud, to cheat. First Timothy 6, 5. And James 5 and 4. To defraud. That's strong. So a man is actually cheating when he's not doing the same with the woman. Particularly when she says she's on a 90 days fast. The interesting thing about this, and you need to hear that this may not sound very controversial. <laughs> but if you see verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 7, the fasting is not in the original. Like I said, some of you are very particular now about the original, and you are marking it. Oh, it's not there. The fasting is not there. Now, it was incorporated to show abstinence, but it's not there. It's just prayer. So when Paul says the wife has power over his, over his body, the, the, power, the word power there in verse 4 is the word exousia. Is used for rights and privilege. Rights. Exousia. So it's a privilege. So your wife gave you the privilege in marriage and your husband gives you the privilege. It's a right that's been given only to be withdrawn when the marriage ceases to exist, which is a very rare occurrence. So it's to be given. Now pay attention to something. In verse 5, it says, Defraud not one another, don't cheat, except it be with consent for a time. See again, conjugal, it's conjugally and mutually done. That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come again together, that Satan doesn't tempt you for your incontinency. Uses the word, we give yourself which is the word sholazo, S-H-O-L-A-Z-O, used for to be free from labor. That's an interesting word. Paul is saying that you are discharging yourself from a responsibility to pray or to, con to, con to focus on something else 
which means that he uses sex as a responsibility. Even though it is pleasure, it is a responsibility. Using the word sholazo means you are free from a duty to be able to do something. The word devote yourselves yeah, or give yourselves, sholazo, S-C-H-O-L-A-Z-O, is in Matthew 12, 44, empty. And Luke eleven twenty five, free from labor and work. So sex, therefore, is not, it is for marriage. It is not an end. It's a means to an end. We'll look at that. Now, notice in Genesis chapter 6, very critical, when the sons of God, Scripture says, came into the daughters of men, it was deemed illegal, corruption. In fact, it was called violence. So therefore, 1 Corinthians 7, I'll come back to that later, maybe not this week. 1 Corinthians 7, it means it's a leisure as taught in scripture. It's not procreation. Procreation will happen, but procreation is not the basis for sex. The basis for sex is marriage. Where two people conjugally, mutually, loyally express their sexual pleasures to each other. Now, the Old Testament, to know how important it is, Exodus 19 and verse 15. Exodus 19. When Paul says, I mean, Moses says, you know, let's talk, talking to the men, let's go up. Then he says in 15, be ready against the third day, come not at your wives, which means don't have sex at that time. It's not procreation. He says we're going to have something to do so you will not be able to have sex. And that's exactly what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 7, 5. So it is not to have kids. Exodus 21 again and verse 10. If you take him another wife, a food and raiment, and a duty of marriage shall he not diminish. That's talking about the polygamous institution. That this is within their culture again, um, where he says, if he has another wife, he said the first wife must not be deprived of the duty of marriage. That's important. And in many instances, the first wife isn't having kids anymore, but there is a duty of marriage that he has to follow. For Samuel 21 and 5, First Samuel 21 and 5. David answered the priest and said, Of a truth, women have been kept from us from these three days since I came out. And the verse of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common. There it is, it was sanctified this day in the vessel. Again, just like Paul said, it is for the purpose of doing something. So where, where sex is not given is for the purpose of service, devotion. That's why when you have what we now call celibacy, it is for the purpose of serving the Lord. That's all. It shouldn't be any other reason. Okay? So, let's drive a few things home as much as we can. So, procreation, a secondary reason for sex, in that sense, oh, that's not it, sorry. I take that word secondary out, sorry. Procreation, another reason for sex, is for God's purpose is to fulfill God's plan and agenda in the earth. And so the way a believer thinks about procreation and having kids is not the way an unbeliever does. Now let's see a few things. I want to uh, you know, deal with something first before I get to that. So Paul deals with sex in 1 Corinthians 7, 3, 4, and 5 that it's pleasure. He doesn't talk about having children. He just says pleasure, rights, privileges. And do not cheat. Now, listen carefully. This is critical. You must have wondered why Songs of Solomon was written. People have said about Christ and his church. No. No New Testament author referred to that book. It's not about Christ 
and the church. It's about a man and his wife. Now you need to let's read it. I know you've never read it before, or you read it quietly. For some, that's it for some. Sons of Solomon. Let's go there. It won't hurt. It's in your Bible. Look at the things that he's talking about. Not nice for church. For Sons of Solomon 4, he describes the wife. Then he goes into verse 3. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet. Thy speech is comely. Thy temple, I don't know what that means, a piece of a pomegranate within thy locks. Thy neck is like the tower of David. This guy is rude. Where on there hang thousand bucklers, all shoes of mighty men. Verse 5. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins which feed among the lilies. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the mountain of men. This is talking about sexual pleasure, what we call today orgasm. That's what he's talking about. It's in the Bible. That can't be Jesus and the church. Come off that nonsense. How can you say... <laughs> This is about a man. And who else can write it but Solomon? <laughs> Abraham can write this. Abraham needed the spirit of God to have sex. But not Solomon. So God has a way of working things out. It's part of the kind of guy this guy was. So the songs of Solomon shows how honest the Bible is. And how the Bible is not in any way anti-sexual. This is not a book about Jesus and the church. Please. I know we have the banner of ours is love. And we, it's nice to sing it. But the banner of our me is love there. Maybe we should look at it. Songs of Solomon. 2 verse 1. I am the rose of Sharon, lily of the valley. Oh, yeah, good. And the lily among tongues, so is my love among the daughters. Hey, I know we call Jesus the rose of Sharon. He is. It's a romantic name. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house. His banner over me was love. So it's about relationships generally. And it's poetic. And this is Solomon expressing love. So writing poems and toasting, you have God's word on it. Go ahead. And you know, you can see how he exaggerated. Like the Tower of David. That's exact, but it's not a sin. If you're expressing love and affection, it's not a sin. Of all the stars, you are a bright and morning star. God is just a carry. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the point. We're going to exploit a little bit more. Amen. But shows the Bible is honest. So there's mutual consent. 1 Corinthians 7, 5. The word song for most is used by Paul. Two of you will agree together. And that is why sexual lives of people must not be a public issue. It's a yada. Intimate, private, personal. And therefore there's no general rule. Oh, and some people give different rules and principles. No, it's something the couple will agree on. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is something you must discuss. So the moment your wife wants to talk about sex, you don't say, come on, we have a, we're changing lives, we're changing life. We're changing. You know. <laughs> if you don't want your life to be changed, you better have that conversation. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, are you in church? Are you sure? You are going quiet on me. And verse 9. And it's more talking about the man who cannot abide like him. Then he says, a woman, if they cannot contain, let them marry. It's better to marry than to burn. The word contain there um, is the word egratis. E-G-K-R-A-T-E-S. It means to have power over your choice and your decisions. Titus 1.8 and 1 Corinthians 9.25. Like and he uses it in a legitimate way, which means that, the, the, the listen carefully now, the burning is a legitimate desire. Okay? But within the confines of marriage. Don't forget. But it's a legitimate desire. That's why he uses egratis. 
Can I contain? Let him marry. So we have two things that are very critical. Procreation, which I'm going to get into later, and pleasure. Procreation and pleasure. Can I go on? I know you say yes, you go on. So, now let's see something that the Bible doesn't present. The Bible never presents any perfect marriage. Forget all these seminars and all the Facebook stuff. Please, forget all that Instagram nonsense. I have a, I had a couple, I'm saying it again, that I was counseling on divorce, not to get divorced, and they were doing program together. And there are many like that. Adam and Eve, let's see the kind of marriage they had. Blame game. Just put it, topic, um, summarize them, blame game marriage. Abby? Is it not you? Is it not you? So people from relationship before marriage, they are not doing blame game. Is it not you? Is it not you? Look at you. If, no, if you are not coming to my life, I'll be a billionaire. A lot do. Cain's wife, we don't know much. But Sarah and Abraham. <laughs> You don't want to talk about that, right? That marriage is nothing perfect. They just had Isaac. Just leave the rest. You know? And she, she's quite a strong woman. You know? But it's not... Uh... Okay, Isaac and Rebecca. Would you like your, your wife to tell your son to lie? Well, see, you are... You are Esau. Like, don't bore me. Yeah. Not so cool. Jacob and his wife. Skip that one. Joseph married an Egyptian. <laughs> Moses, his marriage caused his siblings to have leprosy. David had Michal. Also skip Solomon. <laughs> so you, have, you have Esther. Don't skip Esther yet. But Esther married a gentle king. And um, people talk about Queen Esther festival. And what they try to do is funny. They say, let's do a Esther. So they march across the state. No, that's not what she was doing. She didn't do it for the public. She did it in the bedroom of the king. That culture is not your culture. And don't adopt it. What was she doing inside? <laughs> so I did LME classes. <laughs> but Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house will serve the Lord, we'll explore that later. But the point remains that marriage is a responsibility, it's a relationship. Before you say I do, these are issues you must think about. Am I ready to partner with God in procreation together with this guy? And of course, like we said, is this someone I want to be intimate with and have my private life revealed and exposed to him or her? In Joshua 24, 15, I'll close here. Hope you learned something. Joshua 24 and 15. Look at that point God says as for me and my house, see what he says. Joshua 24, 15. He says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side. Well, I'm reading 14 first of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. It seemed evil unto you to serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Paul mirrors this and in 1 Timothy 3, he said, a bishop must be one who rules his household well. So whether you're a woman or man, you have a responsibility to lead a household for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the part of marriage we should also talk about. Be blessed. Stand to your feet.